Hello, John Reed, Aerodinosaur. Today we're going to talk about and see in action the very earliest Lockheed Constellation model, the first iteration of what is often called the Short Constellation, as opposed to the better known Stretched Super Constellation. Designed and built in Burbank, California, this first constellation was developed during World War II as the C-69 for the United States Army Air Force, and later as the definitive commercial airliner designated L-049, or simply 049. While we, while we refer to both these military and commercial designations, our core technical discussion is relevant to both aircraft. It's a constellation version that's rarely covered in video social media. More than 95% of constellation coverage you see is that of the latter constellation models and stretched 1049 super constellations, as several restored examples of these conveniently continued to fly right into this current age of audio accurate video technology. The 049 didn't get nearly that far as it shut down its engines for good almost a half century prior. And I know of nobody alive today that has a memory of what an 049 sound signature was actually like. The 049 was the first true intercontinental and transoceanic airline flagship in the earliest days of the fledgling post-war airline industry. It was the first pressurized airliner and its speed and comfort made long-range travel reasonably palatable for the broader public, and was the one airliner that first began the process of truly shrinking the world starting way back in 1946. The 049 beat its nearest competitor, the Douglas DC-6, into service by over one year. Yes, as always, you'll get some technical stuff here. But then you'll jump into my personal time machine and experience me and my family's freak 1963 encounter with a very special 049 constellation. It was the very 049 that would be destined in years to come to be the very last one ever to take to the air. It was TWA's former Star of Geneva, then operating in its later colors with the third tier short-lived Eddy Airlines. For my family, this chance meeting would later prove to be a brief, if not awkward, intersection of several historic events, both well-known and not so well-known, under the wing of this very aircraft. It involved a massive breakout of Wyoming forest fires, the Kennedy assassination, the Hollywood disaster movie craze of the 1970s, and a ghostly apparition that seemed to appear from the century before. Not necessarily earth-shattering coincidences, but kind of fun. And no, I really don't believe in ghosts. Even though in 1963 I witnessed this special 049 operating up close, after the passage of almost 60 years, I cannot recall the sound of its engines. I should mention that the Boeing B-29 Heavy Bomber utilized the same troublesome first-generation 2,200 horsepower Wright R-3350 engine, known as the Duplex Cyclone, that the 049 Constellation used. Up to around the year 2004, there have been many direct audio-accurate videos of the commemorative Air Force's B-29 Fifi when it still retained its Duplex Cyclones, as you hear now. You might suggest that I just dub in some B-29 sound with our 049 footage since it's the same engine. Not so fast. The B-29 utilized four blade props and ran all exhaust through two long pipe tunnels into and through two respective second stage parallel turbochargers before exiting each nacelle. Therefore, the B-29 you just heard sounded muffled and quiet compared to the 049 which had larger diameter three blade props and short, open and unobstructed exhaust ejectors with no turbochargers in the way. Really, the two aircraft are different airframes and have different engine installations that resonate and sound differently. Wait a minute. I think I hear something. I'm actually hearing the cackle of a short stacked duplex cyclone. 
Let's see, by the exhaust note, I can tell you there are no extended exhaust tunnels or turbochargers. Um, but it doesn't feature the slapping whine of a three-blade propeller either, like the 049 had. I can't tell if the exhaust is running through the normal collector rings or straight out of short stacks. Um, probably the latter, because it actually sounds similar to a DC-6 running up one of its R2800s on the ground which had Siamese straight stacks. Most importantly, it doesn't sound like a B-29. Oh, now it seems, it seems to be gone. Well, that may be the closest we ever get to the sound of an 049 in this or any other video. However, it still can't be totally accurate, especially because I don't hear a three-blade prop and I don't know what kind of aircraft or test stand it's mounted on. At this Aerodinosaur channel, we deal in the truth, and the unassailable truth is silence when covering the 049, as today's audio recording technology was just not there during its lifetime. The 049's C-69 origins go back to the late 1930s with design and development spearheaded by none other than Howard Hughes and his airline, TWA. But it was Kelly Johnson of Lockheed Skunk Works fame who did the heavy lifting. Designed first as the commercial L-49, due to World War II, all commercial constellation development and production was diverted to the military as the C-69 transport. Its first test flight was in January 1943, which went very well. Here's Howard Hughes deplaning after piloting the C-69 to a record-breaking transcontinental 1943 delivery flight to the U.S. Army Air Force on the East Coast for testing. For this, the C-69 was temporarily painted in commercial TWA colors for publicity purposes. The Constellation featured a serpentine fuselage with a scaled-up E-38 fighter wing and triple vertical fins so the plane would fit into TWA's existing hangars. It was the first pressurized transport and the first with hydraulically boosted controls. This trademark triple tail became a vestige that lasted throughout the production of all Constellation and Super Constellation variants long after much larger hangars became the norm. The plane was 95 feet long with a wingspan of 123 feet and carried 60 passengers on average, making it the highest capacity transport of its day. It was also the fastest transport to date with a maximum speed of 375 miles per hour while cruising at 275 miles per hour, which was faster than the B-29 and most fighters of its day. In August 1945, it made a record New York to Paris flight in only 14 hours and 12 minutes, compared to Lindbergh's 33 hours, at only a 52% power setting. Ultimately, 22 C-69s were built, but only 11 saw limited Army Air Force domestic service trials by the end of the war in 1945, and for a short time thereafter. The Army Air Force had abundant and cheaper Douglas C-54 capacity, and though much less capable than the C-69, they decided to focus on the C-54s instead. The C-69's 18-cylinder double row R-3350 duplex cyclone was a disastrous engine virtually throughout its life, being prone to overheating, power loss and fire, sometimes with disastrous results for airplane and crew, particularly with the B-29, but also with the C-69 and 049. It had 18 rather bulky and tightly packed cast cylinder chugs, as you can see here, which were inefficient at dissipating the tremendous amount of heat they generated. There was only room for intake pipes between these rear cylinders, as you see here, and not exhaust passages. Due to lack of spacing between these fat cylinder jugs, the forward row of nine cylinders had to port their exhaust forward, as seen here where the red port covers are, 
essentially requiring two exhaust collector rings, one forward and one rear, instead of the normal arrangement of just one larger ring in the rear. The forward ring, dumped into two fared short ejectors, one on each side as seen here, with the rear ring dumping into two short ejector pipes behind the front ones through a cowl flap cutout. Unfortunately, the forward ring contributed to excess heat that flowed through the already hot cast cylinder cooling fins. The telltale sign identifying an 049 were these two forward fared exhaust ejectors. These spaceship-like protrusions were not found on any later constellations or super constellations as these used second and third generation engines that were able to utilize conventional all rear facing exhaust dump systems because of properly redesigned cylinder jugs. All later generation R3350 variants included improved, smaller, and stronger forged and cut cylinder jugs that were less bulky and took less space, allowing the addition of front row exhaust pipes between the rear cylinders, as seen here on this R1830 with the conventional single rear collector ring. This is a comparison of the R3350 duplex Cyclone's cylinder cutaway on top compared to the next generation R3350 Cyclone 18 cylinder cutaway on the bottom. I think this illustration speaks for itself. The concept of supercharging is extremely important in any discussion of large reciprocating aircraft engines. By necessity, all utilized geared up single stage supercharging located in the rear supercharger housing on the crankshaft axis between the carburetor and the intake pipe manifold. This pinwheel shaped compressor, often called the blower, turned at much higher RPMs than the crankshaft. This blower served to boost manifold pressure to increase power beyond normally aspirated non-supercharged engines you typically see in automobiles. The single stage blower increased the aircraft engine's specific power output for the same cubic inch displacement at all power settings. Each level of supercharging is known as a stage. Most long range four engine heavy piston airliners, including all constellations and super constellations, as well as Douglas DC-6s and 7s, had single stage two speed blowers. Low blower speed was used to boost engine power for up to around 10,000 feet before shifting to high blower that would recover manifold pressure at high altitude and allow for crews at around 20,000 feet. As I just touched on, many combat aircraft such as the B-29 had a two-stage system which added exhaust-driven turbochargers in addition to a standard single-speed gear-driven blower. The turbocharger pressurized the carburetor intake to sea level pressure so that near sea level performance could be maintained up to and beyond 40,000 feet. Again, this accounts for the muffled sound signature of the B-29 compared to the C-69 and 049. I should mention that there were several other supercharging combinations associated with large World War II combat aircraft that are beyond our scope here. The duplex cyclone was a stopgap engineering anomaly that was not totally Curtis Wright's fault. Early in World War II, Curtis Wright badly wanted to do a corrective redesign, but scarce resources and war-related government red tape froze this bad design in place during the entire war. The badly configured engine was already in full-blown mass production for the much-needed B-29, and the resultant oversupply of this engine after the war was readily available to Lockheed, allowing it to immediately commence production of the stopgap commercial 049 Constellation version of the original C-69 that lasted into 1946 without requiring installation redesign. It wasn't until 1947 that the properly redesigned next generation R3350 was available to go into production and Lockheed immediately responded by designing this new engine into its follow-on L749 constellation. Due to structural enhancements and other factors, the maximum takeoff weight for the 22049s converted from C69s was increased by 14,000 pounds from 72,250 pounds to 86,250 pounds. With further such enhancements during production of the 66 new 049s, maximum takeoff weight grew all the way up to 98,000 pounds. 
049 production ended in May 1947, a very short stopgap production run. In February 1946, both TWA and Pan American inaugurated the first 049 services on long-range, transcontinental, and transoceanic routes, and by far, they operated the bulk of 049s. Air France, British Overseas Airways Corporation, Capital Airlines, American Overseas Airways, KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, LAV, and Pan American Grace were also original operators of the plane. However, these major airlines fairly quickly sold most of their stopgap 049s into the secondary airline and private markets with the advent of the L749 constellation in 1947, but a few 049s hung on with TWA until as late as 1961. Better known second and third tier 049 operators over the next 20 years included American Flyer, ASA Airlines, Standard Airways, Eddy Airlines, Modern Air Transport, Pacific Air Transport, and Paradise Airlines, but there were many more. During the 1960s, and especially into the 1970s, the number of operating 049s dwindled to a handful. The very last revenue passenger flight of an 049 was flown by what I suppose is pronounced Kizkiyana, or something like that, in 1977, between San Juan and Santo Domingo, with the aircraft being scrapped very shortly thereafter. Coincidentally, during a layover, I spotted that aircraft parked at Love Field in Dallas five years earlier in 1972, while it was being operated by a Christian missionary group. The final flight of any 049 was to Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1978 on an empty ferry flight from somewhere in Texas after a long period of storage in both California and Texas. It started life in 1946 as TWA's Star of Geneva. She was scrapped on site in Fort Lauderdale around 1986. What I'm now talking about was the very mystery plane my family and I accidentally stumbled upon in Wyoming in 1963. But for now, let's climb into my time machine and go back to the unavoidably silent era of August 1963. At that time, our family happened to be vacationing at the Grand Tetons. During our stay, several eerily gray smoke plumes could be seen towering into the sky on all horizons to the north, east, and south. It was forest fire season, and such fires were being reported all over during our stay. Unfortunately, my father didn't capture any of these smoke plumes in his home movies. We were staying north of Jackson Hole at the foot of the Grand Tetons in a very sparse cabin, which was part of a lodge comprised as several cabins known as the Highlands. That's us on the cabin porch. This is what family Western vacations looked like in 1963. I thought this chairlift view of the then small town of Jackson Hole was interesting taken about an hour before our chance encounter with our notable constellation, a full 15 years before it became the very last 049 ever to take the skies. After the chairlift ride, we drove by the Jackson Hole Airport, and then something took my dad by surprise. From a distance, he spotted the triple tail of a Lockheed Constellation parked at the airport which baffled him because he thought this airport would be too small to handle something as large as a constellation, probably because the full runway was not visible at this point. We drove up to the airport terminal to have a look. We all piled out of our car. The first thing we saw was what appeared to be a Waco biplane or something similar doing touch and goes. Next, Taxiing out was the very first rear-windowed Cessna I'd ever seen, in this case, a 206. Introduced in 1962, the 206 is still in production today with an almost identical profile. I couldn't have known that 20 years later, I'd be piloting Cessna 182 Turbo Skyline RGs with a rear window profile like this one. We then take up our position right on the apron in front of the constellation. 
Don't try this today or you'll be promptly apprehended and interrogated. Sure enough, it was that 049 flown by the charter operator, Eddie Airlines. It may have been pronounced Ed, but I've always called it Eddie. It was a very small supplemental carrier headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. Eddie had two 049s on its certificate from 1963 until it ceased operations in 1966, but Eddie only flew one of them in 1963, which was this one. The registration of this constellation was November 90816, which stayed with this aircraft from its initial operations with TWA as Star of Geneva until being scrapped in 1986. However, my dad and his movie camera were again distracted as he excitedly took this clip of a famed Hollywood actor of his generation, Van Heflin. Heflin's walking up to board a Frontier Piston Convair 440, along with what appears to be his handler or assistant. The 049 Constellation appears right behind him. Before Dad starts shooting, Heflin glances at Dad, aiming his movie camera at him. Dad embarrassingly asks Heflin if it is okay for him to film. In an extremely gentlemanly manner, he tells Dad, no sweat, friend, go right ahead. We never determined what Heflin was doing in Jackson Hole or where he was going on this day. Dad apparently didn't think to check the airport schedule. That eight-year-old kid you see in the left foreground is me, caught in front of Heflin in a few rogue frames as he begins his walk to the convoy. If you look closely, God only knows who or what that horrific, ghostly form of a lady is behind him in the lower right corner. You might find it interesting that Van Heflin was the lead character in the 1963 World War II movie entitled Cry of Battle, which had just finished shooting. Just three short months after this freeze frame was taken, Cry of Battle was playing at the Texas Theater in Dallas on November 22, 1963. On that day, Lee Harvey Oswald was captured inside that theater during the immediate chaotic aftermath of the Kennedy assassination. At the very time of Oswald's apprehension, the marquee sign over that theater read, Van Heflin, Cry of Babel. Let's face it, Van Heflin has long disappeared from the cultural lexicon, and most of you have never heard of him. However, strangely in line with this Jackson Hole Airport footage, he played the lead antagonist seven years later in the 1970 box office hit Airport, which coincidentally spawned three sequels throughout that decade with successful Airport 75 and 77, and finally Concord Airport 79, the latter of which was a flop. In the first airport, he played alongside Dean Martin, Burt Lancaster, Helen Hayes, and George Kennedy. Unfortunately, he couldn't star in any of the other airport sequels due to his unexpected death in 1971 at age 62. However, the airport series ignited a broader series of 1970s disaster-themed thrillers that resulted in such movies as The Poseidon Adventure, Towering Inferno, and Earthquake. After Heflin's Frontier 440 took off, we witnessed these Native American forest fire smoke jumpers loading their gear and boarding the 049. The plane taxis out and takes off to the south and banks southwest, probably heading toward Eddie's Salt Lake City base. Pay particular attention to the blue line below the passenger windows and the blue chevrons on each of the three vertical fins. In 1966, this constellation, 90816, was passed on to another supplemental, Pacific Air Transport, who operated it for many years before it passed on to several other fly-by-night operators and brokers until it wound up in Fort Lauderdale at the conclusion of the very last 049 flight in 1978. Most surprisingly, it retained those very same Eddie Airlines blue markings, tail chevrons, and original registration 
with only the operator's titles changing over the years. Sadly, this is the rotting 90816 just before being chopped up in 1986. A sad ending for the very last 049 to operate, which had identical DNA to the World War II C-69 from 40 years earlier. On her slow deathbed, one got the sense she was still actually communicating with us, even up to her dying day, because she refused over the decades to shed her blue stripes, her blue chevrons, her very identity. After putting up with the inevitable technological change to which all her contemporaries yielded, she seemed to have had enough of it, starting way back in 1963. So, now you know how a few random tangled threads of history briefly collided with the average American family under the wing of a proud star of Geneva once upon an August morning. <laughs>